Okay. So uh, putting a bow in Acts 2.38. In our second discussion, we talked about um, what it means to call in the name of the Lord. And then we got into Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. So some of this will be a review of our first two discussions. Uh, I'll try to move quickly. Um, the first two discussions Trey and I have already had. I would recommend you watch those two first if you come across this one on the internet. As like I said, they've all been building. So in the first discussion, uh, we discussed Paul's conversion. We talked about Acts 9, 22. We talked about 1 Timothy 1, Acts 26, Galatians 1 a little bit. And we talked about how Paul retold his own conversion story. So we showed what the Bible said about how he was saved in our first discussion. And Paul told us that he met Jesus on the road. He believed, he confessed, he fasted, he prayed. And while most of the religious world today, and I would say the last 500 years of Protestant Christianity, the would tell us Paul writers, all of those guys for the first what, couple hundred years, all taught baptism what are we doing for here? the remission of sins. So <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know what just happened. All right. Go ahead. All right. So, um, while most of the religious world today, like I said, in probably the last 500 years of Protestant Christianity would tell us Paul was already saved, the question I would say is what does the text say? What do the scriptures say? Not do what not what do a majority of people say uh, or what do a majority of people living today say? Matthew 7, 13 through, and 14 says, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Uh, narrow is the gate, difficult is the way that leads to life, and there are few who find it. The majority is not headed for salvation. Exodus 23, 2 says, don't follow a multitude or a crowd to do evil. So we as Christians, we don't follow the majority. We follow the text. What does the Bible say? We follow God's word, even when it's against uh, the majority. Uh, Romans 3, 4, let, every, uh, let God be true and every man a liar. So when the majority of the world tells us something different than Paul, and the majority of the world says, well, Paul was already saved. Do we follow the majority, the last 500 years of Protestant history? Or uh, do we... Uh, follow the Bible? Or do we trust what uh, Ananias, sorry, look at my screen was freezing. I couldn't see if Trey was there. Um, do we trust the miracle working preacher? Okay, there you are. Of God, uh, preaching God's gospel, Ananias, who told Paul to arise and be baptized and wash away his sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now, in the first discussion, Trey said Ananias wasn't inspired, like Bible writers, uh, and I can give timestamps. And then by the second discussion, Trey said that he was inspired. In the second discussion, we also discuss what it means to call on the name of the Lord. And we looked at how calling on the name of the Lord was used chronologically in the New Testament. And we talked about the first time was Acts 2.21. Now, this was the day that Jesus told the apostles to go and wait for in Luke 24, 47 through 49. After his death, burial, resurrection, he tells the apostles, hey, the new covenant hasn't started yet. It's going to come. Go wait in Jerusalem. And that was in Acts chapter 2. So they're in the city. They're waiting for the promise of the Father, which was the miraculous outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. Peter and the other apostles begin to preach. The people accuse him of being drunk. He says it's the third hour of the day. You know, the bars aren't open yet. Obviously, we're not drinking. And Peter says, we're not drunk. This is what Joel, the minor prophet Joel, prophesied about in Joel 2, 28 through 32. And so Peter finished uh, his quotation of Joel 2, 28 through 32 with Joel 2, 32. We know it is Acts 2, 21, which says, And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, I know this is sort of a side note, but... Uh, if you have watched our previous two discussions, in the first discussion, Trey argued vehemently that you have to call in the name of the Lord to be saved. He even made many arguments about how the Greek of Acts 22, 16 said washing away sins and calling on his name were linked. Uh, I counted 11 times. He referenced, hey, you have to call in the name of the Lord to be saved, right? Then in the second discussion, we go to Romans 10, 10 through 14, and Trey changes his position completely and says you're saved as soon as you believe and before you call in the name of the Lord. And so, I mean, I don't think Trey will do this, but if he denies changing the position, I will give the timestamps. I'll post them uh, in the info box if I have to from the first two discussions, because I can show that his position changed. Now, from Acts 2 through uh, Acts 2.22 through 2.35, Peter continues to preach about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And in Acts 2.36, Peter tells the people, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God made this Jesus, whom you crucified, Lord and Christ. Verse 37, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, I think common sense tells us that these people are asking, what shall we do to be saved? Trey thinks that the people are saved already and that they're asking, hey, Peter, since we're saved already, what should we do now? I think it's wrong. I respectfully think it's wrong, and I'm going to show you why. So Peter responds to their question, what shall we do? I'm adding, you know, emphasis added Aaron, to be saved. He just said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He preaches, they're pricked in the heart. They say, what do we do? 
And Peter responds, repent, imperative command, and let every one of you be baptized, imperative command, right? In the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now notice, uh, repent is an active imperative. It means it's something that you must do. Peter is commanding them to repent. I'm commanding you to do this. So you haven't done it already. Be baptized is a passive imperative. It means it's something someone to you. You don't baptize yourself. God does the work in your baptism spiritually. Physically, somebody else is dunking you under the water. It's why you don't baptize yourself. You're simply submitting to God's word. Now, in the last discussion, Trey said that this means repent and be baptized because your sins are already forgiven. And I mentioned in that last discussion that ace is a preposition 1774 times given uh, in the New Testament. Uh, maybe there's a textual variant somewhere that could switch it one way or the other, but 1774 times in the New Testament, ace is a preposition. And it's defined, Art and Gingrich. Me and Trey have mentioned BDAG, Bauer, Danker, Art, and Gingrich. Well, the guys, Art and Gingrich, two of them from that list, they defined ace as to or into, indicating the point reached or entered. Strongs and Thayers define it the same way. It's, it's pointing forward. Uh, I offered, and I'll offer again, the paper I've written on that exact word and the topic as if this word can sometimes mean because of. I've sent it to countless people since the last discussion, and maybe I shouldn't offer this again, but if anybody wants it, send me an email at gallagher at gbntv.org. So does ace mean because of in Acts 2.38? In Romans 10.10, does belief mean because of righteousness? No, it's the same word. It means believes unto, towards righteousness. In Romans 10.10, does it mean confession because you're already saved? No, confession unto, ace, confession towards salvation. In Acts 11.18, repentance because of life? No, it's repentance unto life. In all those verses, and I could give many more, ace is used and the text is pointing forward. One is not saved before belief, confession, or repentance, according to the proper application of Scripture. Now, if Trey's right, the people in Acts 2.38 were saved already before repentance, then Peter sort of seems to be confused as you move through the text. Look at Acts 2.39-41, through 41, right? In Acts 2.39-41, through 41, For the promise is to you and your children, and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Now, I would say that you and your children as the Jews and all who are afar off are Gentiles, Ephesians 2 references them that same way. And then Peter continues to preach. Look at what he says in verse 40. With many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this what? Perverse generation. Peter says, Be saved. That's a New American Standard or New King James. It's a command, notice. And uh, the ESV says, Save yourselves, right? So what does Peter mean by that? Trey says, Well, there's nothing you can do to save yourself. Well, obviously, God is the one that does the saving. But obviously, Peter says there's some sense in which you have to do something to be saved or save yourselves. That's what Peter said. I mean, Peter's inspired. And you got to ask yourself, are you going to trust Peter who commands people? You need to do something to be saved. You need to save yourselves in a sense. Or Trey that says you don't have to do anything. Um, that's up to you. I'm not going to make the decision for you. But why does Peter say save yourselves or be saved? Why is it a command? Imperative mood in Greek if they're already saved. He wouldn't com be commanding them to be saved if they were already saved. So why would Peter be saying it? Obviously, because they're not already saved. Uh, I think Trey's position is wrong. I, I do think this, that Trey's a very smart guy, but I think that it's a position that one is forced to hold on to because of Reformed theology. And like Trey mentioned, they have the idea that you're totally wicked. Uh, some people call them vipers and diapers, and you cannot choose God because you're so wicked and evil. Therefore, God has to work a miracle on you to make you believe, and as soon as you believe, you're saved. I just don't think the theology works in the first discussion with Acts 22, I don't think it works in Acts 2. And hopefully, if we have time, we're going to see other passages that it doesn't work. So let's keep going in the text. Acts 2.41. Then those who gladly received his word were what? They were baptized. And that day, 3,000 souls were added to them. Okay. So what's the, the, the statement here? Those who received the word were baptized and 3,000 souls were added. So those received his word were baptized and 3,000 souls were added. Look at verse 47. Let's read that. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. So if you compare Acts 2.41 and 2.47, you can put them on a piece of paper or whatever. Acts 2.41, the people who received the word were baptized and added. Verse 47, those who saved were added. So hence, those who received his word and were baptized are those who were added and those who were saved. That, that This sort of process doesn't end in Acts 2. Obviously, chapter divisions were entered by man, right? It goes through the whole book. Look at chapter 3, 
I want you to give three parallel passages. Write them out on a piece of paper for yourself. They're close together. Acts 2.21, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Acts 2.38, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. And look at Acts 3.19, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Now, Trey would have to say that that word that in Acts 3.19, that word that your sins may be blotted out is ace. Okay. Trey, with his definition of ace would be, you should repent and be baptized because you already have forgiveness of sins in Acts 2.38. If he was consistent in 3.19, he would say that you're supposed to repent and be converted because you already have remission of sins, right? So if Trey were to read Acts 3.19 the same way he reads Acts 2.38, repent and be converted because your sins have already been blotted out. Now, I don't think Trey would say that one is converted after they're saved. I would hope that he wouldn't. But if Acts 3.19 were consistent with what he's how he's... Uh, approaching Acts 2.38, then that would that would be what he would say. Now, I think he would likely change the usage of the word. As A.T. Robertson says, some people change the usage of the word to fit their theology. So Acts 2.38 does not mean repent and be baptized because of the remission of your sins, but repent and be baptized into, towards, looking forward to the remission uh, of your sins. Uh, Acts 2.38 is the same exact Greek construction as Matthew 26.28. Um, ace, Ephesian, Harmartion is the, the three Greek words. Ace, into, Ephesian, uh, Ephesus to send away, remission, forgiveness. Harmartion is sins. So in Matthew 26, 28, this is, uh, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Is Jesus's blood, was it shed because of the remission of sins? No, it was shed, what? To order to obtain, to purchase uh, the remission of sins through Jesus's blood. And so, you know, there's there's a book, uh, exegesis is basically the fancy word for how you read the text and looking what the text says. Uh, exegete means to draw out. Um, uh, in John 1, 18 it is, uh, it talks about how the son came to exegeomai the father. The son came to declare the father to us in John 1, 18. So a guy named Gordon Fee wrote a book called New Testament Exegesis. He gives four steps to determining the meaning of any word in Greek, right? He says the first step, is that you need to establish the meaning of the word prior to its use in the biblical text and see how far back that word goes into Hellenistic Greek. So he basically says the first thing, he even gives the first step you should do is consult Greek English lexicon of the New Testament, other early Christian literature. That's BDAG. That's what we, that's the short, instead of saying Greek English lexicon of the New Testament, other early Christian literature, we just say BDAG, okay? And so um, if you look up BDAG, what does BDAG say about Acts 2.38? Uh, it says the fourth definition, a marker of goals involving effective abstract suitability into to, to denote purpose in order to. So uh, for the forgiveness of sins, so that sins might be forgiven. And it lists Matthew 26, 28. It lists Mark 1, 4. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. It gives Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. So the guys at BDAG say, hey, what does ace mean? Well, in this, they say it means looking forward to the remission of sins. So BDAG references Matthew 26, 28 and Acts 2, 38 by saying they should be translated the exact same way. Um, I, I also think it's interesting that uh, I already mentioned that nobody that wants this because of use of ace ever does that in Matthew 26, uh, 28. So the blood of Christ, to be clear, before anybody hops in and forgets what I'm saying, the blood of Christ is what remits sins. It's what forgives sins. But submission to water baptism is the time at which God remits sins by applying the blood of Christ. So God acts in water baptism. How does he do it? God forgives, Ephesians 1, 7. He adds one to the body, the church, Acts 2, 47, Acts 5, 14, they were added to the Lord. He washes away sins, Acts 22, 16. He puts one into Christ, Galatians 3, 26 through 27. He saves us through the resurrection of his son, 1 Peter 3, 21, and he applies the blood of Christ. Revelation 1.5. So just finishing up quickly, the problem in this discussion is not that one of us thinks God's sovereign and the other doesn't. Uh, I think Trey wants you to think that Aaron says God's sovereign, but he doesn't really believe it. I believe God is sovereign. He makes the rules. He spoke the universe into existence. And whenever someone else speaks their own universe into existence, they can change the rules. But until then, God is sovereign. He gives man free will. God left heaven, came to earth to give his life on a cross as a ransom for many. And then he expects us to look to the cross, be grateful for the sacrifice of Christ, recognize our own sinfulness, not sin we got from Adam, but sin that I freely made a free moral agent. I chose to commit that sin. 
And then I'm supposed to recognize my own sinfulness and respond in love for what Christ did on the cross. Romans 5, 9, that God, while we were yet sinners, died for who? The ungodly, us. And to respond in belief, repentance, confession, and baptism to have those sins washed away. And so whenever someone does that today, the same thing that happened 2,000 years ago with the apostles happens. Uh, they're forgiven of their sins, they put on Christ, and they're added to the New Testament church. And that is, I don't know, 15 minutes. So I guess I can just go ahead and, and stop there. That's Acts 2.38 in a nutshell. Dude, I told you how busy I was, and you had all that written out. I didn't have time to prepare for all that. Okay. So that was good. That was a good Church of Christ answer. And so um, can I ask any questions or not? Um, I'm fine with the question. Do you <laughs> want to give your Acts 2.38 rundown first, then we can write questions down, and then we can ask them like back and forth? Okay. Uh, so, um, Acts, yeah, that's fine. Okay, cool. I'm good with that. Um, Acts 2.38. Uh, Brothers, what shall we do? Um, he's right. It does not say, what shall we do to be saved? Now, he puts that in there. Now, here's what's really weird. Now, think about this. If I hold the Church of Christ to the standard in which they hold everybody else to, it doesn't say alone. It says just we're justified by faith. It doesn't say faith alone. Well, it doesn't say, what shall we do to be saved? That question is literally asked right here. Brothers, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Uh, so that's that. So here's the deal. This is uh, Pentecost. The new covenant was already, the new covenant started at the death of Jesus. And that's where it's a hard time for um, for the church of Christ, for the thief on the cross. I don't I do not do the thief on the cross deal like, like a lot of people because... I was in the Church of Christ, and I was prepared for that. I knew that those answers. So, but the the really hard one is, if you're going to be honest, the the the, the New Testament, the New Covenant, the New Covenant started when Christ died on the cross, and uh, so, yeah, that's that's the bad thing for the thief on the cross. He wasn't baptized, and Jesus died before the thief on the cross. Um, what shall we do here? So these guys are here in the gospel. They're at Pentecost. And they were cut to the heart. I think we always forget this part right here. They were cut to the heart, right? And if you look like Lydia, oh, God opened her heart to hear the message. Um, that's what God does. That's why you pray. Even you, Church of Christ people, you pray, God, I pray you open their heart. I pray you open their eyes. And then he does it. And then they become a Christian. And then we go and slap them on the back and say, boy, you chose to get baptized. You did it. And God's like, I thought I get all the glory. Well, you do. But I mean, he did a lot. You know, it's just it's just contradictions everywhere. These people were cut to the heart and they were broken hearted. They're like, oh, my gosh, what what do we do? Because you know what? Jewish people always there was always covenants that, that God made with people. He always made promises and he always gave them a sign. He always gave them a sign of the of the promises that he made. He gave them a visual sign to go back and remember the promises that he made. Like um, with Noah, he gave him a, a rainbow. Right. That was the sign. Just the big Abraham one. Right. Circumcision was the sign that you can trust the promises of God. And so these Jewish people know, like, well, God, okay, well, what do we do? Like, what do we do? How do we make this world? What do we do? And so he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, because that's what Christians do. People who are cut to the heart and who have turned, they, they look to Christ, they're broken heart. Like, what do I do? I mean, this is what people ask me when I share the gospel with them. What do I do? I'm like, man, repent of your sins. Call out to God. Tell him. And then guess what I do then? Then I tell them about baptism and I baptize them. We put, I put a very high price tag on baptism nowadays. I used to not. Used to, baptism was like a layup. Hey, this person wants to get baptized. Let's go get them in the water. Now I understand the, the meaning of baptism, that it's basically you're, you're joining the family here. And I don't want to go too much. I don't want to use a lot of time on this. But basically, you're joining the family. And if you join this family and you're going to show us, look, you tell us what's in your heart. But if you do this in front of the family here, basically you're changing your last name to Christian. So when you go off, we're coming for you because that's what families do. We're not going to just say, well, I guess it didn't take or, you know, what I guess it didn't take. A lot of you Church of Christ people have heard that that phrase. So we don't say that nowadays. We don't say, well, I guess it didn't take and just let him go. We're like, no, he's family. I remember his profession. I remember him saying that he believed in Jesus Christ. I remember his life changed and we baptized him and he put on Christ in front of us to let us see the, the heart change. No, we're going to get him. That's what we're going to do. So these people said, what do we do? That's what they did. And here, uh, I mean, just think of, um, let me just see. 
uh, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. And so he baptized people for the forgiveness of sins. Why? Pointing to Jesus, pointing to Jesus for, for what, for what he is about to do. And then after the cross, so you have the cross right here, John the Baptist is pointing people to the cross. And then you have people over here, right? You got these people and we're getting baptized. Why? Because of what Jesus did at the cross unto the cross, maybe not because of, but unto, because of what he had did on the cross. Sorry, I said because of, but unto, unto the forgiveness of sins. That is the BDAG word. So I, I'm in my redneck theologian self, I just say, because I don't speak that way, I would say just unto what Christ has done or because of what Christ has done. So John the Baptist looking towards the cross and everybody in the Old Testament, and we look back to the cross. So we're getting baptized. It gives us a visual picture of what Christ has done. And so Again, don't don't fall into the trap of believing that every time you read the word believe, every time you read the word faith, every time you read the word calling on the name, that that all means baptism. That is the formula that the Church of Christ has, has really dripped in your head your whole life, and, and you've come to believe that. Like he said, he wants to go down here to chapter 3. And look at chapter 3. Look. And his name, by faith in his name, he has made this man strong. How, how did he make this guy strong? By faith the faith that's through Jesus Christ. Repent, therefore, turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. That's what Isaiah was saying when we were talking about Justin Martyr, what he was talking about. That's, that's it. It's a changed heart. It's a calling on the name. It's not verbally saying it because people can't do it. It's, it's something in the heart. It's a heart change looking, calling on Jesus Christ. Look at here in chapter 4. Look at verse 4. He wants to talk about how God added to the church. 3,000, Acts chapter 2. Well, I guess this one's better because all these look, but many of those who had heard the word believed and the number of the men came to about 5,000. Huh, wow. Now he's going to try to tell you that, well, the word believe there means baptized. And like, you're, and nobody in their right mind, you want to talk about just read it for what it says. Like That's his standard. Hey, just read it for what it says. Just take it for what it says. Well, okay, I'll take it for what it says. Uh, Acts 16, they literally asked the question, what do we do to be saved? And they said, repent and believe. Here, take it for what it says, believe. Believe does not mean baptism, ever. Believe does not mean baptism. Believe means believe. And we're going to look in those Greek words and all of that. So let's look back at Acts chapter 2 here, okay? I think this is pretty neat. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. See, church Christ don't do it like that. They don't baptize people in the name of Jesus Christ. They say, can you just do what it says? Well, they don't do what it says. It says to do it in the name of Jesus Christ. I understand why we don't, but they give commentary, which it's good commentary. We do it under the authority of Jesus Christ. That's good. But let's give some commentary here for the forgiveness of sins. Look, rites and rituals don't save us. The Roman Catholics believe that. They believe that the Eucharist and taking the Lord's Supper, that saves you. They believe that also baptism saves you. You have to do that. You have to do this. You have to do all these other things. So does the Church of Christ. They believe that... These rites and rituals save you. They don't. Only faith alone in Christ alone saves you. But here, when he says this, look, repent, be baptized. Why? Look at this. I'm going to go back all the way to John 7. I took a note while you were writing or when you were talking. John 7, 37. And like he said, look, before we look at this, I want to say what he says. Look, don't believe. You know, he said, don't believe, Trey. Just believe the word. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> And don't believe Aaron and him, you know, doing word judo and, you know, just word judo. Let's just believe Christ. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Now, that's not literal. Like, that's not literal, right? And that's what we're going to hear later. But it has some meaning. There is some meaning behind it, though. Whoever believes in me. As the scripture has said, wow, what scripture is that? Old Testament. Remember what Isaiah was saying? All the old scriptures were saying, you're not going to read about being baptized into Jesus in the Old Testament. Now, you'll read about Christ, about God, putting his, like, explaining John 3. I'll look at that real quick for you. But if anyone thirsts in, and let him come to me and drink, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, this he said about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet, the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus has not been yet glorified. Like, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, now this is said about the Spirit, whom those who 
I guess we're going to have to convince people that that word right there means baptized. That's what it's got to mean that. Now, don't believe my words. Don't believe Aaron's words. Believe the word of God and deal with it. And just say, you know what? You know, it's a hard look. It's, it's getting hard. It's really hard. And you're going to pay a very high price. And you're going to lose friends, family, probably your job and your positions in, in the church of Christ. When you say, you know what? I believe the word of God over Papa or whoever. Look at this scripture. And guess when they received this spirit? And when did they receive it? When they were cut to the heart and they believed. When they believed in Christ. So when you look at, I'm just going to do this right quick while we're, you went to a lot of other ones. I'm going to go here too. This, this, uh, be born again here. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless he is, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Look, you cannot, according to Jesus, you can't even see that there is a kingdom unless you're first born again. You have to first be born again before you can even see it. Yet we're trying to tell people, look at the kingdom, look at the king, make a decision, do all that, right? No, 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 that's not how it works. You don't even, you can't even see the kingdom unless you're first born again. And so he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom. Here's what's funny. And I had to wrestle with this when I was coming out of the church of Christ, because I would say, well, that's talking about baptism. Every time I read the word water, it has to mean baptism. But then I would talk about the thief on the cross and say, well, you know, he didn't mention baptism then because, I mean, he hadn't died yet. He hadn't been buried. He hadn't been rose from the dead yet. So what's the point of mentioning baptism if he has not died yet? Well, if I'm being honest with myself, I'd say, then, then why is he talking about baptism here to Nicodemus? Because he ain't even near dying yet. Nobody even knows what's about to happen with just Jesus of dying, being buried and rose again. So you're telling me at the end of his life, he didn't mention it to the thief on the cross because there's no point. Because baptism is about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus united with him like that. Then why is he telling Nicodemus it, right? So he goes on to say, that which is flesh is flesh, because look, which is uh, born of spirit of spirit, goes on, right? Nicodemus doesn't understand. And Nicodemus says, how can these things be? Jesus said to him, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you don't know these things? Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you don't understand these things? What things? Right here, right above it, being born of water and the Spirit, being born again. How do you not understand that? You are the teacher of Israel. How do you not understand it? Well, what was the teacher of Israel to do? Well, he read the Old Testament. And if we look here in Ezekiel 36, check this out. I'm going to get down here to verse 26, I think it is. Here's what it says. This is what God will do. I will. Not you will. No one else will. I will. God will. I will sprinkle clean water on you. Not literally. Physically, not really. Spiritually, yes. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness. uncleanliness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. God will do that. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will change your heart. I will cut you to the heart. I will cut you to, I will do it. I, God, will do it. That means I will make you born again. And I will put my spirit within you. Check this out. I will put my spirit in you and cause you, and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Now, how can you obey his rules and, and, follow his statutes, I, mean, it, look, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk. How will you, how will you do this, God? Because you're going to cleanse me. You're going to open my eyes. You're going to open my heart. You're going to take out my heart of stone. Give me a new heart. Cut to the heart in Acts chapter 2. And then I will cause you to obey me. So there, there's a lot more we can go to there. But at the end of the day, water baptism, rites and rituals have never saved anyone. Uh, Jewish people believe that. The Pharisees believe that their, their rites and their rituals did. Uh, Roman Catholics believe that rites and, and their rituals and their ceremonies, they believe that it'll save you. Um, Mormons believe that. Uh, and I'm, I hate to say it, but my, my, my people, that where I came from, the Church of Christ, believe that as well. They believe that not, they don't believe that, that all the people who believe will receive the Holy Spirit, like Jesus said, but the Spirit's not given yet. But all those people who do believe, they're going to receive the Holy Spirit. Just like Paul believed that if you just believe, you will receive the Holy Spirit. That's how you receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this baptism is a sign of the uh, gospel. It's a picture of the gospel. It is nothing more. It's a beautiful thing. It's nothing to take lightly, but it's not salvific. It's not when you're saved. You're saved by faith in Christ, by believing on him. That's how you receive the Holy Spirit. The baptism is a picture 
to give you a sign and a seal of what God has done to you. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I'll just stop there. Give me just a second. Just talk for a little bit. I'm going to get me some more water. You just want to take a quick break? Sure. We're going to take a little break. We'll, uh, 